Hi, Dina. Oh. Hi, how are you? Hello. How are you doing? I'm so excited. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, I think it's both of our pleasures. <laughs> yeah. So I used both of these stories. I paired them together for the kids' midterm. And, you know, the theme was following the crowd. And, you know, it went really well. And they loved the stories. They, they you know, it, it was great because after the midterm, we had a conversation about it and it, it caused quite a stir, you know, especially the man in the well, because they have a, you know, they have, they were debating, you know, that, that thing that they were, as an English teacher, it's like your that moment of joy when, um, you know, they're, they're fighting about different things. So they have a lot of questions about the man in the well. Um, it's not a true story. <laughs> That's my first question. It's an excellent story for a conversation, however. <laughs> So that's my question. So um, for both of you, I know, Graham, you said that the ravine was, there's, there's some, there was legend, right? So tell me, was based on? Yeah, um, yeah, that story was sparked by something my sister told me about a, um, a boy who went up into this pond above her house, a pond I used to swim in when I was in high school, and he jumped off, you know, very high cliff into the water and never resurfaced and uh they never found his body hmm. is what i was told from my sister and i thought wow that's pretty fascinating and i want to run with that so that was the spark for the story and i just created the cast of characters and uh, came up with a storyline but but that fact that mystery kind of held it all together and so that's where it came from the feeling and is there is some legend in there that is uh in fact legend you know mm -hmm. the the stone with the goddess in it that uh, that's all legend and there is an actual stone uh down the way from that pond all hawaiian uh legend uh, but other than that it was all fiction the, the feeling that you, that you have as he's climbing is so visceral of the, of the sort of the, the the fear of it which is almost incapacitating <laughs> Was that something that came from you or is it something that you that you lent him from somewhere else? Definitely came from me. I, I have a, a fear of heights. Every time I get up a high place, if there's no barrier between me and the precipice, I always feel that I'm going to just jump. You know, I, just, I know. I, I know your fear. It's not there. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, I, I remember being on the big island and, and uh going around to this place where you could hike along a trail on a steep cliff and the trail was, uh, you know, not very wide and there's no barrier and you can hike around and go behind the waterfall. And I was with a group of my cousins and we all wanted to do that. And they went all the way and I got to a certain point where I had to get down on my hands and knees and crawl. And then I turned around and said, I'm not doing this. I cannot do it. So <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Maybe in my last life, I fell off a cliff or something. I don't know. but Yeah. It, so I know that feeling well, though. <laughs> yeah, so there yeah, was a little bit of Vinny in you. I mean, oh, or you're in Vinny. Oh, definitely. Yes, definitely. I think what I one of the things I love about the story is the ending. Um, just how that be, that moment at the end where, you know, he's just he's full. He's so peaceful. He's he's at peace with his decision and he looks out and he realizes how beautiful the island is. That's yeah. my favorite part of the story. He's a new man. <laughs> right. Mm. He's happy to be alive as well. With different <laughs> eyes. Yeah. Someone wanted to know if his mother ever found out. So those are the, a lot of the questions <laughs> were like that. I, I, wanted, I want you to know that. So this is going to be my question is that, do you think about your characters for both of you? Do you think of them as having lives prior to the story and after the story? So... I'm going to tell you that all of my questions are going to be along those lines from the students. So they put all their questions together and there, there was a lot of like, did his mother find out, find out if his mother found out. And I'm like, okay, I'll find out. Like, so did his mother find out? <laughs> my answer to that question is, you know, I would have to write the story to find out. Um, they can write their own ending and find out for themselves. Um, 
it's just one of those things that has not come up yet. So do you think of your characters in terms of like having a life prior to the story and after the story sometimes? Do you want to answer that, Ara? Um, it, it depends. It, de it depends on, on what it is. I can't say in this story that would have been the case. Uh, so how did the man fall in the well? They want to know. Uh, it, that's that it really isn't something I know. Okay. Um, I don't know <laughs> it any more than they know it. <laughs> and um, why didn't they help him? Well, that's that's really the sort of nut of the story. Right. Um, and I guess it's I'm more interested in posing the question than in answering it. Right. Um, because I think that speaks a lot to what people are like. They are not right. straightforward. Um, and there are a lot of parts of them that are hard for people to get at. And sometimes in writing, um, you have the experience of trying to get at the question because it, it uh, if you try to name all the answers, then you kind of suck the life out of, out of the characters in the story and out of the story itself. Mm. I get that. Why was his mother crying? Was there a relationship between... Uh, because they, they they wondered if if she knew the man and the well, or so it's a little it, unclear why she was crying. Right. It you know one of the things um, I've talked a fair bit about this story over the years with with different people. Um, there's a there's a, a fellow out who teaches in Cincinnati who I've become friends with, whose name is Gary Weissman, who's a he's a was a, really a Holocaust scholar uh, primarily, um, but he taught this story for many years. And I talked about it with his class. And one of the things I'm always amazed about is students, of course, pick up all kinds of things about the story that I don't. Um, and one of the things that I told him is also, you, when you read it, you, you are approaching the story as a reader. And as a writer, you often don't approach it as a reader. Um, the reason that passage was really in there was about pacing in the story. And it then gives the story um, it creates an atmosphere in the story, but it wasn't placed in there uh, by design to tell students something um, specific about what was happening. They understand that there's some, something is wrong in the family. It's not that it has a full backstory to it, but the genesis of that was really, was really in pacing the story. Um, and so... I, I couldn't kind of create something that uh, sure. you know that would answer the question fully. It does, however, offer a reason for him not wanting to say anything to his parents because he sees that there's so much turmoil, he's just going to back off, and so that does give credence to why he doesn't say anything. Yes, well, it has to in some way. It's when you kind of add something to a story and you don't know why. Sometimes, it, it, which I think happens fairly often, okay. it at least has to feel like the right thing to do. Um, and sometimes you don't even understand why it's the right thing to do in the moment, but it has to, it has to feel correct. Um, but that's true. It, it means he's less likely to talk to his parents because of this tension that's already there. And it also maybe gives some insight into some of the turmoil that's in him because he's of course not making fantastic decisions at this moment. Sure. Um, yeah. They do, they do want to know if the man died. <laughs> And once again, I, I can't. Know, it's, I'm sorry. I, I, it, it's uh, the messenger today. Well, no, no. It's it's it's. <laughs> I don't know anything more than what's in the story. So it's uh, you know the sort of implication at the end is that there's rain coming, and of course that would be really bad news for a man in a well. Um, but I can't. You know that okay. the story ends when it ends. No. Okay, because they that's where the debate came in, and they were you know that was a, it was a great moment for me to see them fighting about no no well the ring came and then it, it helped him escape and I'm like I, it doesn't work like that I drew on the you know the well and the um, yeah. they were angry they're really this it evokes a lot of emotions the story for sure um, yeah no I'm, in a good way you know. And I think it, one of the things that uh, I see a lot of is people also, they read things into the story that aren't necessarily there. People sometimes decide that there has to, man must be responsible uh, for what's happened, that the reason he's in the well is that he did something terrible. Um, people try to figure out, um, they, sometimes students try to figure out a way to make the story okay in a certain way. Um, 
And it's one of the things that's been interesting about, about talking to readers down the years um, is that people read all kinds of pieces of themselves into it. Right. Yeah. It, it's in the thing that I pointed out to them um, was how there really are, it's, it's just one mind. They all, you know, and it's written in a way as if they move together as just one unit, you know, um, he says, we, you know, we, you know, we left, we, we did this, we did that, we got fruit, we, you know, it's just one collective mind, right? That group think that you were talking about in our email. This is another thing that I learned from reactions to the story that, that it, it, they really do function like one mind. And um, this wasn't by design, but the character in the story, do you think it's a boy or girl? So that's mm -hmm. funny because it, the different midterms, they referred to I and I I just assumed it was a boy and I, and then I had a few midterms, a few responses where they were referred to the character as a female. And it wasn't something I realized until I readers asked me and I realized there was no indication of that. But that is is some indication of how kind of how much a part of the group this person is that they are they're actually somewhat disembodied in the story. Um, but that was really incidental. <laughs> I thought of him as a boy myself, but maybe it's a fact of who's reading the story. You know, they they, they right. sort of identify with the character. And there were girls there. It wasn't like it was a group of boys. There were girls there. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was a mix. Yeah, and it yeah. My my students want to know um, about your writing process. So do you do you outline your stories before you write? Uh, that depends if I'm writing a short story or a novel. I'm basically a novelist. Um, however, I've written several short stories. Um, I always want to know where I'm going. I want to know the end, uh, the end and the beginning. If I can, generally speaking, know those two bookends, then I'll start creating what could happen to get from here to there. <laughs> and this, that's basically how I start. And then I start thinking about certain scenes and I, I just have a collection of scenes and ideas. And then after I've done all this thinking and research, so it's, I kind of put them together. So they kind of flow in a certain way. And then I just start writing. And uh, as Ira said a little bit back, things happen that you don't expect. I mean, you're riding along, you think you know what you're doing, and the character wants to go in a different direction or say a different thing. Um, things pop up that, that you go, oh, wow, that's pretty, pretty cool. I might run with that. And so it's quite a magical and amazing process. But I, th I think really you have to, or at least I have to know where I'm going. Uh, I want to know my point. What's the point of, of this whole journey? And so that's kind of how I do it. Outlining is good for me, but keeping a lot of it open for surprises. And, um, you know, I think if I just started writing, I, I would just kind of wander around and nothing would be cohesive. Right. So outlining is good. Yes. We did have an author come on my podcast and she's a pantser that she writes, you know, by the seat of her pants and she doesn't know, you know, what's going to happen next. And, and she finds out as she goes. So I would, I personally would be an outliner <laughs> and then little things would pop up. Um, but how about you, Ira? Yeah, a lot of what Graham said is rings true for me. I think I don't know where I, where it's going to end. Usually it grows around kind of like a middle instead. I have some core piece to it. Um, a while back I wrote a story or, or I wrote a novel uh, called Gentleman of Space and in it, the core was really the idea of somebody looking up in the sky and seeing his father, um, literally seeing his father in the sky. And so this, the story becomes about astronauts and it becomes about all these things, but it essentially grew around this little nugget. Um, and very much to what Graham was saying, uh, I think it's the, the process of writing it is really the experience of learning what you're, what mm -hmm. you're doing. Um, I think about it a lot like a plastic art, like you were making a sculpture. You can't actually have a sense of what you're doing unless you're actually forming it. Uh, you can think about it a lot in your mind, but in some ways it operates just like anything else. Like you're making a painting, you can't really 
you don't have a painting until it's actually until you're painting it. Um, and so writing is a lot like that. You don't actually mm -hmm. have anything. You can't think really without writing um, if you're writing something. Graham's a painter. I believe that's one of his paintings behind him. Is that right? Is that? Graham? I wish that were. Oh, no. <laughs> but you are a painter. Yeah, so. I didn't paint that one. This is uh, Peter Fiore who lives in Pennsylvania. Your stuff uh, is beautiful. Uh, it's just as nice. What do yeah, you paint? Uh, sort of a, well, I do two styles, a traditional landscape painter and then uh, one I call prismatic art where it's full of color. And it's sort of a impressionistic. Um, yeah, it's just my my current artistic direction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been in all kinds of directions in my life. <laughs> Does yeah. one in, do, do you find the the two things inform each other, the painting and the and the the writing? Um, not really, but I I think in the process. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the process, um, and. and I said uh, in my storytelling, I want to know where I'm going, but I, I totally agree with you that sometimes where I want to go is not where I end up. And things mm -hmm. happen in the story that take you somewhere better. And I love when that happens better than what I thought. It just, it's better. So I go there. And the same thing with the painting. You know, I, I might have a direction and I'm going along and colors pop up that, you know, they're imaginary colors or something like that. And I just, uh, I, I run with that. And so the, really the proof is in the pudding when it's all over. How does it hold together? So it's, so it's, it's as a writer and an artist, I, I can say that I feel more relaxed if I'm creating a piece of art. Do you feel more relaxed painting than? Oh, absolutely. I, I just get in the zone. Yeah. A painting is, is, is a total zone. A writing can be a zone too, but sure. painting, I don't know what, what it is about that, but I can just drift off have music on and just go somewhere else. <laughs> Look at the clock and say, where'd those hours go? That's yeah, good. Do you ever get writer's block? Uh, I rarely get writer's block. I just kind of, I, I know that it's just an excuse to like, you know, not do anything, get stuck, just kind of push on through and things will pop up again. Once they start popping up, you get excited again, but you know, there are always points where you feel, oh, this isn't going anywhere, but it's not gonna go anywhere if you stop trying to, to write something. So it's just a mindset. I think uh, writer's block is an excuse not to work. I, I, I also don't have an experience of it. I think it must exist for some people, but it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, cause I do know people who've gotten incredibly stuck. Uh, um, I, I have a friend who once described uh, what I find tends to be the process for me. I'm hardly ever working on one thing at once. And he described working that essentially what would happen is you wind up working on your guilty project. You have the thing that you tell yourself you're supposed to be doing, but then you have the thing you actually really want to be working on. Yeah. And so sometimes things happen kind of a little sideways like that. You tell yourself you're working on, a novel and but meanwhile there's some short stories and then you can't get one out of your head and so you sort of find yourself in there and then essentially the things get finished that should get finished right yeah. and also so much of writing is in editing so if you just allow yourself to you know even if it's in your mind poor writing you know if you allow yourself to write you know poorly if you will um even if it's your imagination you can always go back and change it. Just keep writing, just keep writing. And, you know, again, so much goes into editing, going back, a fresh pair of eyes, you know, revisiting, letting it sit for a while. I think that's hard to teach students. I, that's really struck me down the years is that, and, and it certainly struck me with, with my own children is that idea of learning that uh, it's never about the first pass it's never about the second pass. It's really, it's a cumulative project where um, it's actually so much of the pleasure of it is how it changes over time. Um, but I think it's not how people are taught to do most things. They're taught to sort of a one and done right. um, way of thinking about almost everything. Um, right. And so it doesn't, when you, when you talk to students about it, I think it, I remember it took a long time for that idea to settle in for me, I'm sure it wasn't until after college when I really started to understand 
what it was to approach a story or a longer work. Right. So I, I, I love this question. This will be one of my last. The student, one student asked, um, what's, the, what's the one book that you wish you had written? So you read this book and you're like, ah, I wish I had written that. And, it, and he wanted to clarify. He's not asking what your favorite book is. So you can each answer that as best you can. I wish mm -hmm. I'd, that's, that, that was the book I wish I had written. For me, it's Island of the Blue Dolphins. That's always yeah. been top of my list. It's actually the book that made me want to write for young readers. Um, I had written my first novel, Blue Skin of the Sea, and um, my editor uh, said, well, this book could be for adults or kids. Which way do you want to go? And I had no idea that there was a world of books for kids out there. So I said, give me a couple of weeks. Let me go to Borders at the time and look at the kids' books. And I was amazed at the array of reading material that there was for young readers. In my youth, we did not have that. But so I go there and I look at all these books and I had no idea where to stop. So I just started looking at covers. And this one book I kept coming back to all the time because it had a beautiful painting on the front. It was Island of the Blue Dolphins. And so I said, well, I'm going to buy this because of the cover. <laughs> and I was really taken by that book. I, I said, at the end of it, I said, I want to be Scott O'Dell. I want to write. I want to be him. So that, yeah, I think that book, and it's still going today. Um, didn't you receive the Scott O'Dell Award? I did. I sort of came uh, full circle on that when I wrote. You must have done something book. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I got the Scott O'Dell Award and I go, wow, this is amazing. And then I went to New York and to collect the award and I was given the award by Scott's wife. He had passed by then. But it, it, it's absolutely of everything. I've All my accomplishments, that's my number one favorite accolade. Um, it's kind of amazing how all that happens. And I became a reader because of a book, too. And the book was Alex Haley's Roots. Right. And that's the one that turned me into a reader. I was just, you know, that vicarious experience you get when you read a book and you sort of, you know, you become the character and you're just sucked in. And you can't wait to get back to the book at the end of the day or whatever. It's just that's when that happens, you know, you're in heaven <laughs> as a reader. It's uh, it's an amazing thing. But yeah, I'll end the Blue Dolphins. I wish I had written. Iron. <laughs> Boy, I mean, there are a lot of books I wish I'd written. Um, yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> it's, a, it's a world full of those things, and it really is that feeling of, uh, you know, it, it's there. Periodically, I'll go through a passage where I'm not reading things that I love, and it's hard because it. I find I I'm avoiding reading, and the difference between when I'm reading things that I love, and I, I that's all I want to do, um, <laughs> is, is enormous. Um, I'll give from the many things I can think of um, that I wish I'd written. Um, I'd mentioned a first novel that I wrote, uh, Gentleman of Space. And after I wrote it, a friend of mine gave me or told me about, and I then purchased a copy of this book by a Russian writer um, that I, uh, I hadn't read beforehand, but uh, was somehow, it was such a perfect version of the kind of tale that I was telling is very concise and very wonderful. His Russian, his name is Viktor Palavin, the Russian writer, and his book, which is an early book by him, really a novella, was called Omen Ra. And it's about uh, essentially, it, it's kind of a parable about Russian space exploration um, in which you realize at the end that there is no Russian space exploration. Um, and it's, there was something so kind of wonderful and moving and really horrific about the book um, that it, I just felt like it, it kind of did all of this work that I was trying to do in a more complicated way, uh, very simply um, in, a, in a sort of wonderfully just precise way. So I have a lot of love for that book. <laughs> so the last thing we're going to talk about is um, something that I don't feel as though people talk about, because we always talk about the writer's block, but uh, the reader's block. So there's no one's, is that even a term? So <laughs> I just coined it. Not being able to read, you know, 
in the same sense of not being able to write, you know, feeling that block. Um, it's something that I struggled with as a young student um, into my early adulthood where I, my mother was a reader uh, begging me, you know, I wanted to be a writer. And I, you know, I was always writing, writing, writing. And she said, you have to read, you have to read. If you want to be a writer, you have to read. And I had a very hard time um, getting into books. Um, you know, it was something that came later in life. And I try to help my students, you know, to to find that book, Graham, that you were talking about, where you just get so excited and it pulls you in, that first book. Um, so, you know, what advice, I guess, would you have for students? I mean, it's always, you know, find the book that you're going to like. And I always try to match the student with the book to get that, to ignite that love and that feeling inside. Oh, it, to me, it's not a matter of being able to read. It's wanting to read, um, loving to read. Right. I mean, it's like when you say, do you have a reader's block? I say, you mean, do I stop breathing? <laughs> I can't, I have to read. Once you get the reading bug, it's with you for life. At least right. it has been for me ever since I read Roots. Um, and I was 30 years old. That's when I started to read. All okay. the way up until then, I was surfing or just hanging out with my buddies or doing this and that. And I didn't even think about reading. So I think the first discovery of a real vicarious reader's experience is what's going to turn your students into readers. And so you discover the joy of story. And as story is, I mean, it's like a magnet. It just kind of pulls you along and you want to know what happens next, what happens, what happens. And um, once you catch that bug, that's, that's what you need to do is put a bunch of bugs out there for them to catch. Right. <laughs> a lot of good books. And, right. and there are a lot of really good books. Uh, but I think it's a whole, it's a matter of wanting to read. It's just like when I went to college, my, my first year was a disaster. Then I went into the music business and you know did rock and roll for 10 years. And I went back to college because I wanted to go back. And I, I, I graduated magna cum laude because, just because I wanted to. That's the only difference. So I think it all has to do with desire. And uh, if you can just right. sort of build that in your student, the desire to do this or that or to improve themselves. Or yeah, if, if they don't have anything to hang on to, they're just going to wonder. I often feel that it's something which is also, it's increasingly not the way that people, um, not taking information, but it's not how they, well, it is increasingly not how people take information, but it's also increasingly not how um, people um, find pleasure in the world. Uh, mm. It's, you know, I know a number of really bright, people in their 40s, uh, people who are artists in other fields who just don't read. Um, they're really not interested in it. And it's, you know, somewhat sad for me, but, yes. uh, <laughs> but it is, it, it's, a, it's a very abstract kind of pleasure in a way. Um, I was talking about it with my daughter the other day, she's 17, and she is fortunately an avid reader. Um, but it is, it's very strange when you think about it. You're looking at a blank sheet of paper with, or not a blank sheet of paper, you're looking at a sheet of paper with just marks on it. And from that, you are pulling out a whole universe of information that works automatically and somewhat seamlessly that you don't even consider. I think a lot of people don't have a, they don't have a comfort with language in a certain way. I see it all the time with students when they, when they write, as opposed to read, when they um, they don't have a, they don't feel like they have a voice in it. And so they're trying out different ways of relating that are, um, they feel must be how they should relate instead of actually feeling comfortable. Um, and I think the same thing happens when people read often, they just don't feel, um, they don't feel cozy with it. They don't feel, uh, somehow as if they can get in that close to it. And I've, I do worry that it's something which is drying up. I mean, people take in most of their information through, you know, yep. through visuals right now, through, you know, videos or other kinds of, you know, visual medium um, that tell people, you know, they want to watch things on a computer. Um, and so. Mm -hmm. And it's like this, it's fast, fast, fast paced. Yes, it's, a, it's an entirely different pacing. Um, Instagram world. 
And it also sort of plays into this idea of that people should be shown the truth in some way, that there's something that they're going to see and that makes it real. Um, and one of the things that I do like about writing is that it's basically you, you have to make it and it's as real as essentially you believe it is. Um, if it feels true and real to you, then it can be, um, but not because somebody has shown it to you. Um, and it, I think, teaches you to think differently about information that you're given in other places. Right. It's beautiful. And I think that's where we're going to end. And I'm just going to share my last theory that I think the boy <laughs> went missing at the ravine, that we had this conversation with another student and that he, he is the man in the well, that the boy at the ravine is the man in the well. That's our theory. <laughs> Subterranean, <world>. yes. <laughs> Well, I can't thank you enough for sharing your time with my students. I, I really appreciate it. And um, listen, anytime you want to come back, we're always here. You're always welcome. To, it was a complete uh, pleasure. It, was a it pleasure. has been a pleasure. Yeah. It's fun to meet Ira, too. It's been very fun to meet you, Graham. Yeah. You, you have my middle name. <laughs> What's that? My middle name is Graham. Oh, Awesome. <laughs> We're all part of the same distant Scottish clan somewhere. And my dad, who was Graham, was from Long Island, New York. So there's another connection, East Coast. <laughs> See that? <laughs> I had a feeling this would work. It was very um, nice meeting both of you. Thank you so much. Same here. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha.